And the idea of using a board game as a teaching tool is not crazy. I mean, Milton Bradley um, was a pioneer of the kindergarten movement in this country. And uh, this is before TV, this is before radio. So the idea that this would be like a means of communication totally makes sense. Um, it was almost all that board games did, right? They were all right. educational and edifying and morally Right, right, God absolutely. All, it sounds awful. Well, and Milton Bradley, you know, he popularized the game of life. And if you look at the original board for the game of life, it is so depressing. It is like, <laughs> there's like a suicide square. And, right. and to this point of games reflecting culture, I think that like, that's one of the things I find fascinating too, is that I think we get very nostalgic about board games and history. Mm-hmm. And over and over and over again, I felt like, and, and with Lizzie's story too, like, now is pretty great. Like when you research what it was like to be a female game designer at the turn of the century, I'm like, you know, like 2015, like we have a lot of work, but like, it's not as bad as not being able to vote um, or, or not having, you know, anybody else at the patent office that's of your gender, you know, it just the hurdles that were against her um, were pretty extraordinary, which makes, I think the genesis of the game that much more astounding. That's right. So Henry George is a huge national figure. He influenced right. a lot of people, Churchill, you know, Tolstoy, Tolstoy. Churchill. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of people. And one person that he influenced was Lizzie who was a woman and she was very independent for her day. Right. I mean, she's, she's not, <laughs> no, she was a very outspoken feminist. She did this stunt that I oh, talk about in the book where God, she puts herself up for auction and um, likens her, you know, status as a woman and how she's being paid to slavery. It's like Yoko Ono. It's like this public stunt to, right. to gain attention for an issue. I thought it was fascinating. Which is, you know, pretty pretty out there, even for where the women's rights movement was at the time. And um, she gets a lot of attention for this. So she's out there. I mean, she's pretty bold. And she, a lot of people likened her to Mary McLean, who was this openly bisexual author who. Um, you know, and I read her books too, because when people kept referring to Lizzie as that, I was like, I need to understand who this woman is. So you can see how there's like so many tangents to this research and rabbit holes I went down. And um, Lizzie also, she wrote short stories, she wrote poetry, she was involved in theater, and over and over again, these themes of justice and inequality and economics come up, um, which I thought was really interesting. And she's very much her father's daughter. Her father was uh, a very influential newspaper owner, James McGee. Campaigned with Lincoln. Camp, you know, traveled with Lincoln during the Lincoln-Douglas debates and understanding who he was. And actually, I read through his Civil War letters, um, which are astonishingly cool. still around. And it's really cool to read them because, you know, you get the gloves on. And these people start to become real human beings. Like, they really become... And this was right before Lizzie was born. But he goes back and forth with his wife about what it's like. And just hearing, like, the tone of how he described things and kind of what his background was um, was really, really helpful. Yeah, so she is a huge fan of, uh, of George, Henry George, right. and she says, I'm going to create a board game to popularize the idea of the land tax, the one tax system, right. Right. and the ideas of how landlords and people with monopolies are not good. And right. so she creates this game called the Landlord's Game. Yes. And there's two versions. Right. There's the version where you bust up the landlords and you, and you are good. And you can win the game that way. Or there's the other version where you become a monopoly and that's how you right. win the game. Right. Sadly, that version <laughs> becomes far more popular. Pretty quickly, right. <laughs> right. So she does this and it really, it takes off. It does take off. It goes viral, but like turn of the century style is how I always describe it. I mean, it becomes a favorite game among like a who's who of left wing America. So Upton Sinclair. Upton Sinclair plays it. Scott Nearing, who was a, a big deal in his time. He had this very um, interesting academic freedom case at Wharton. He was fighting... And um, it, it's played in Arden, Delaware, which is the single tax colony. And you can actually still go to Arden, Delaware, and it's amazing because some of the houses are still there, the cottages. And This is like a utopian society. Right, right. And there was also one in the South. And, you know, single tax theory, we don't know about it now, but it really resonated with people at the time. It was a big deal. And I think a lot of these utopias were set up. And they started out, Arden at least started out as kind of a summer getaway. And then people started living there year round. And... Um, and it traveled by word of mouth. And from there, it kind of goes to, you know, various Northeast colleges. It's a big deal in a lot of fraternities. And it's unclear to us, like, Lizzie renews her patent in 1924, but we don't know how aware she was of just how her folk game had spread. And people start calling it the Monopoly game and localizing it and making it their own. Right,